I mention this title, Frontiers New and Under Review, because it is meant to suggest, in a very clunky way, yes, uh, what we're aiming for, I, I hope, in this session. Um, you know, our day began with some, some broad questions about the, the nature of frontiers, margins, um, and how Caroline's collections might push us to rethink those definitions. Um, and this session, at the end of the day, is meant once again to push past boundaries. Um, boundaries, for example, of chronology. So this session features the earliest paper temporally in the day, uh, which is Jones, and the most contemporary, Elizabeth's. Um, boundaries of place and geography. Um, because we move, uh, as we actually did earlier in the day, to, uh, to frontiers in the south, in colonial Louisiana, and to those of the present-day southwestern US. Boundaries of language. Uh, we move here from French to Natchez to Tiwa language, which is a Pueblo language, and you will hear a little bit about, I think. Um, perhaps some English will make its way in, and other native languages as well. Um, and also, as other sessions have today, um, we're trying to push past boundaries of academic discipline. One of our speakers' home departments is French literature, the others is art history, and their, war their work, both of their work, stretches between language, literature, history, art, material, culture, and political. So we do believe that Caroline's collections encourage us to think past boundaries and margins, and we present this session in that spirit. I'll introduce our first speaker first and let her present and then step up again to introduce Elizabeth. Um, Joan DeJean is trustee professor at the University of Pennsylvania and has been at Penn since 1988. Many of you will, I think, know her work, her pioneering investigations of the French novel in tender geographies, her work as a book historian, as a historian of ideas, and a feminist literary critic investigating, among many other topics, circulation of Sappho and of libertine literature in early modern France, her work as an editor, recovering a crucial text of Moliere's play, Don Juan, Le Festin de Pierre, and her most more recent titles, Addressing Material Culture and the Rise of Paris, which include The Essence of Style, The Age of Comfort, How Paris Became Paris, and Joan's even more recent turn to the Americas is extremely exciting. We here at Penn have had a real privilege, the privilege of watching many of these projects unfold. None, I think, was more amazing to hear about than what Joan discovered through the very deep archival research for her latest book, which is called The Queen's Embroiderer, and which leads into the project she'll present to us today. I'd just like to add that Joan is a master teacher who teaches many of her courses here in the Kislak Center and uses our collections regularly in those courses. She makes discoveries in our collections all the time, including just this week. She, like Caroline, is a collector and a donor to the Penn Libraries, and she is a friend. So it's a wonderful honor to have, for me to share the podium with her, and her talk today is entitled Marie Baron, Transported Convict, Captive Historian. I wish the new head of Penn's Libraries were he was here for this, simply not because I'd want to impose my talk on her, but to hear what I have to say. None of us who do this kind of work could do it half as well without the people up here on the sixth floor. John for the, really the facilitating everything for me and for my students, Lynn for helping with collecting. It's just great. You know, we are so privileged. It's just, I'm a spoiled brat, as I tell people in Europe who have no idea how great it is. You want to see a book, it's out there. You want your students to do it, it's there for the week. So it's great. OK, Marie Baron. I don't want to forget her. In 1703, Marie Baron was born into extreme poverty in a minuscule village 20 miles from the cathedral town of Chartres. Before her life is over, was over, she had traveled the world. She had survived the harshest Parisian prisons and two periods of the kind of captivity that can only be characterized as enslavement and she had seen her story recorded in print in one of the founding histories of the colonies, the 1753 Memoir Historique sur la Louisiane, Historical Memoirs of Louisiana. Marie Baron also survived what was known in English as transportation, the practice of shipping convicts to the co colonies' far-flung colonies. 
The English had engaged in transportation for a century when, in 1719, the French carried out a single experiment. They worked in isolation, without reference, with no reference to contemporary practice in the English colonies. Their only reference was to Roman law. The French thus devised a type of banishment completely new in modern times. The English transported convicts for a fixed period of time, usually seven years. The French deported forever in perpetuity, just as the Romans had. And French officials created a new term, borrowed from Latin, déportation forcée, forced deportation. This was the first appearance in a modern language of the terminology of deportation destined to have such a powerful future in the 20th century. The word deportation first appeared in an official French decree in September 1719, the month before Marie Baron was transported to the New World. It was invented to designate the single French experiment with the transportation of women. That practice and the terminology were officially recognized in a French dictionary only after the revolution of 1789. They were using a word that no one understood. And the word was first used in English only after that in the early 19th century. French practice was unlike English precedent in another essential way. English women transported had been convicted of prime, crimes against property, whereas all French women deported were publicly pronounced prostitutes. And if you're interested in that, it's really the beginning of a modern use of prostitution, but I won't state that. None of them had been officially convicted. Most had had no form of due process at all. Very few of them were even accused of anything even remotely resembling prostitution. And by the way, their influence is so great, some of them in this country, one of today's speakers is married to someone who is a direct descendant of one of these women. And I promise you that Anne Roland uh, Bordelon had nothing to do with prostitution in her dossier, <laughs> unless you consider going dancing one night without your father's permission prostitution. When New Orleans was founded in May 1718, French officials decided that the new colony required African slaves and French women very quickly and in that order. French officials had extensive prior experience with the slave trade, so the first ships from the Guinea coast docked in Louisiana already one year later in May 1719. But the women were a tougher matter. Technology is always a challenge for me. Marguerite Pancatelin, the enterprising warden of a notorious Parisian women's prison, the Salpetriere, decided to get ahead of this game. Already in November 1718, Pont-Catalan drew up a master list of some 200 women whom she pronounced bonne pour les îles, fit for the islands. Within a year, 150 of them had left Paris, chained together at the waist, and had been taken to one of the only, uh, only two ships ever to transport convict women to a French colony. The women crossed the Atlantic in the ship's hold, chained to the floor. Slavery was the only model the French could imagine, with one difference, that is, African slaves had real monetary value, which we can trace for the French, so ships bound for New Orleans from Africa had a doctor on board for the express purpose of checking each slave's health every day and making sure that they were given sufficient nourishment. No one assigned any value to the women. There was not even another woman on board to protect them from the ship's crew. I'm currently reconstructing the lives in France and in Louisiana of the women transported in 1719. I'm trying to determine the big picture, the social status of the women, the geography of their birth, the reasons for their deportation, why their parents chose to do this, and so forth. But today I'll keep a tight focus on one deportee. I'm grateful to Lynn and to John for including this outlier French example, and to Caroline Schimmel, for whose wonderful collection provided the inspiration for this conference. I'm also grateful to Nathalie Lacarrière and Pauline Carbonel, who are here today, because they've helped me dig through countless online archives looking for traces of the women. Now back to Marie Baron. Her early years were a cycle of poverty and death. By her seventh birthday, she had lost both her parents and her only two siblings. When her father died in 1710, the family was penniless, and members of a Christian lay charity covered the tiny sum necessary for a burial. In rural France, this never happened. The sum was so small. Every family could pull, find someone to pay this. This family had nothing. Baron became an illiterate, 
impoverished orphan in a decade of sudden climate shifts that devastated her region, the Beauce, which is known as the breadbasket of France because so much grain was grown there. Um, winters were so cruel and harvests so disastrous that the cost of basic food foodstuffs tripled. In 1709 to 10, the year of her father's death, the mortality rate in France was over 40% higher than usual. Thousands of starving villagers roamed the countryside in, source, in search of food. Cities began locking their gates against ever larger mobs, and desperate paupers would try to dig their way under the gates. Uh, Marie somehow found herself in the largest orphanage in France, Paris's Hôtel Dieu. And there she met a young Parisian orphan just her age, Anne Crétin, and that encounter determined her life. On June 8, 1719, the two 16-year-olds visited what must have seemed like paradise to Marie Baron, a well-stocked emporium on Paris's premier shopping street, the Rue Saint-Honoré, run by a ribbon merchant named Serge. Serge called in the police, alleging that Crétin and Baron had stolen, quote, a piece of ribbon shot through with gold and silver, end quote. And ribbon with, with metal thread did have value. When nothing was found on them, Serge then decided that they had adroitly slipped it to a third young woman who had run away. Their arresting officer, Huron, realized that this hardly constituted an airtight case, so he took it upon himself to add immediately, quote, that he personally knew them to be inveterate prostitutes and thieves. And I assure you, Baron had no prior arrest record, and Crétin had at most had some tiny run-ins for very unrelated matters. All officers of the Parisian police were aware that Warden Pontcatelin wanted to fill her quota of women fit for the islands. They surely also knew that, wardens were, uh, that orphans were considered ideal candidates for deportation. They figured they would, no one would bother about them. Without further investigation, Officer Huron had the two friends transferred to the Salpetriere on June 26, 1719, the day before the regent governing, governing France approved that master list and legalized the forced deportation of women. On that list, Crétin and Baron appear as number 69 and 70. Note that just one day after their arrest for allegedly shoplifting a ribbon, they had already been officially declared public prostitutes. And yes, the police misspelled Baron's name and got her birthplace wrong. They were in such a hurry to round up women as quickly as possible to fill that quota that they made far worse mistakes all the time. Crétin had relatives in Paris who immediately demanded her release into their care. No one was looking for Marie Baron, so on October 6th, she left Paris in chains. The following February 27th, she landed in Louisiana's port, Mobile. She arrived in a colony that was in one key way very like her childhood village. For at least the first four years of her life, famine raged in, raged in Louisiana and the death toll devastated the colony. Marie quickly married Jean Roussin, a young French farmer. Together, they created a prosperous establishment on two arpentes, nearly two acres of land, just outside the enclosure of Fort, Fort Rosalie, the French military base at Natchez. This is an absolute contemporary image of Natchez. And you see the fort indicated to the right in the image, and the building just to the left says the home of Roussin. There's a little tear in the manuscript, so Roussin, unless you bend it back with your finger, I couldn't photograph and bend at the same time. You can't read it completely. The Roussins raised two sons on the land. They cultivated tobacco. An early account describes Baron as, quote, very wealthy. Marie had come a long way from her childhood. And then came 1729. Many of you are Americanists. The minute you heard the word Natchez, you guessed what was coming. The Natchez Indians far outnumbered the French garrison of just 40 men at Fort Rosalie, only half of whom were usually at the fort. French relations with the Natchez had been initially very good, but had deteriorated rapidly in the year prior to November 28, 1729, when the Natchez attacked Fort Rosalie and killed 144 men, 36 women, and 56 children. And by the way, don't think I'm going to give, I don't have time for it here, but this is no standard account of the Natchez mass, they call massacre in French that I'm going to be giving. The documents I'm citing blame, and their French documents, the first published at the period, put the blame is totally on the French commander of the base. Do not blame, I know, 
How many do contemporary documents do you have? No blame on Native Americans, all the blame on the French. In addition, the French word for Indians is sauvage, savages. If you've seen Caroline Schimmel's copy of Guy Finney's Letters of a Peruvian Woman, on the page there, sauvage is highlighted. These documents do not speak of savages. They, call, they speak of the Native Americans as les naturels, the natural ones, the indigenous ones. So this is not at all your standard kind of history. Um, Marie Baron watched her husband and eldest son be killed that day. She herself was taken captive, along with some 50 French women and children and all African slaves on the post. Then began four months of negotiations for their release. All contemporary evidence makes one thing clear. Both sides in the negotiations saw the slaves as valuable property, while the women were barely worthy of a mention. The most reliable contemporary account put it this way, quote, the Negro slaves became free, you might say, and the French women were reduced to the utmost extremes of slavery, end quote. In January 1730, the Choctaws, allies of the French, seized some of the captives, including Baron. They did not free them, but instead demanded a higher ransom. The women's treatment was far worse at their hands. Oh. <laughs> they, had them. they got it, too. By the time the women had been exchanged for guns and ammunition and returned to New Orleans in March 1730, eyewitnesses described them as clad only in shreds of the chemise or shifts that were the women, women's only undergarment of the day. To buy new clothes, each was given a small credit at the city storehouse, money they were soon forced to repay. Of all the French indignities, this is the one that, I don't know why, that's repaying this. Baron was among those who quickly made a new start. On April 19, 1730, in New Orleans St. Louis Church, she married Francois Dumont, a French officer and the son of a prominent lawyer for the Parisian Parliament. They had known each other for some time. When Dumont was stationed at Natchez, he had boarded with Baron and her husband. They had become close friends. Dumont and Baron soon had two children of their own, as well as a prosperous farm. But what about, you must be wondering, the account of Baron's captivity? Women's voices are, after all, the focus of this conference and Caroline Schimmel's collection. Well, Baron's second husband is best known today as the most prolific early historian of French Louisiana. Dumont com composed voluminous memoirs, the basis for this beautifully printed 1753 edition, which is in that pop-up exhibit across the hall. Dumas' memoirs remain the definitive early account of the story of the Natchez uprising, massacre, you, whatever word you want, despite the fact that Dumas himself admitted that he was nowhere near the fort in November 1729. He recorded in his memoirs instead the testimony of the woman he cites numerous times and to whom he refers as my wife. Only recently, following Gordon Sayers' lead, has anyone openly identified Dumont's wife as Marie Baron among the few eyewitnesses to have lived not only through that day, but through every major event in the whole business. Captivity narratives take many forms, but the historical memoirs of Louisiana is surely an unusual one. It's a characteristic high enlightenment compendium of knowledge published at the exact same moment as Diderot and D'Alembert's monumental encyclopedia. Note that the title page stresses the work's indebtedness to Dumas' memoirs. But behind that was a second debt unacknowledged on the title page to Marie Baron as eyewitness. Illiterate orphan, forced deportee, Choctaw slave, enlightenment historian. Baron and Dumas remained in Louisiana until June 12, 1737, when their family sailed for France, taking along provisions for the voyage, a cow, a calf, three dozen chickens, and two dozen turkeys. This is the only recorded instance of a deported convict woman's return to the country that had sent her away in chains. Once in France, uh, the family quickly set out to bring the saga of forced deportation full circle. In September 1737, they visited Marie Baron's birthplace, that little village, and Marie was reunited with her favorite cousin. They then took up residence in the port city of Lorient, where Dumont began work on his memoirs. In 1754, just after this was published, within months of the publication of this, uh, and her, of her story appearing in print, Dumont and Baron went to sea again, this time destined for today's Ile de la Réunion, Re Reunion Island. 
Next to the name of passenger 171, Dumont, the ship's manifest recorded that he was à la table avec sa femme. The woman who had made her first ocean crossing chained to the, in the hold, this time had the privilege of a seat at the captain's table. They later traveled to Mauritius and in 1755 to Pondicherry, which would soon be caught up in the French and Indian War. They survived the sack of the French settlement by British forces in 1757, and Dumont died in India in 1760, leaving an estate of nearly 6,500 French pounds. The couple had turned their life in the poorest French colony ever into a rather spectacular financial success. No record survives of Marie Baron's death. Her story lives on in Dumont's writings, and not only her testimony about the events at Natchez. Upon the arrival of the female deportees in 1720, French officials in Louisiana and France, for the most part, seemed barely to have noticed the transported women. They rarely mentioned the deportees in their correspondence with officials back in France. No one even bothered to record the exact number of those who survived the voyage. Historians today often simply say that nearly all the female convicts survived the voyage but died shortly upon arrival. Dumont, however, recorded once again eyewitness testimony. From his work, we learn how many of the women survived the crossing, 60, and a great deal about the horrendous conditions in which those who did survive spent their early months in a colony that was in no way prepared for their arrival. Marie Baron's testimony is the only contemporary account of the deportation of women to what must be, may be the least charted of this country's 18th century frontiers. We could only think, we could think of her as the first woman historian on these shores and the original historian of women's lives in the colonies. To close, I want to point out two additional oversights in the massively bungled French enterprise of forced deportation. First, Baron's name was not on the royal order that condemned 150 women to transportation. This is October 6, 1719. Um, her deportation was therefore completely illegal. Second, on the manifest of the ship that transported women to Louisiana, next to the name of passenger number 202, Marie Baron is recorded, and I quote, she deserted on the way from Paris to the port of embarkation, Le Havre. So far as French officials were concerned, in other words, Marie Baron's life in, this, in Louisiana never took place. She didn't get here. Um, finally, just one more thing. Dumont records all kinds of things about Marie Baron. People were talking about women's unruliness. He records a wonderful incident in, in Louisiana in the Superior Court um, in which her first husband was protesting because he had bought a, a mule that was lame and he didn't want to pay for it. And the judge ordered him to pay and then put him in prison when he refused to pay. Marie Baron jumped up in court and started yelling at the judge that this was unfair. The judge had her thrown out and fined for disrespect. Um, she later filed a counter suit, ordering, saying that this was everything was unfair. The second judge threw out the first judgment and released her husband from prison and re removed the fines in order that said he didn't have to pay for the mule. He ended his testimony that day, by his verdict that day, by saying, and please give my fond regards to my good friend, Marie Baron. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. And our next speaker is Elizabeth Hutchinson. Elizabeth is Associate Professor of American Art History at Barnard College. Well, Elizabeth um, is the author of The Indian Craze, Primitivism, Modernism, and Transculturation in American Art, 1890 to 1915, which was published by Duke in 2009. And she has a forthcoming book, Moybridge's Pacific Coast, Landscape Photographs and Cultural Topography. Moybridge spent a little time at Penn, as some of you know, so we're connected in that way as well. Um, the Indian Craze, I should say, uh, which is a, a wonderful title, is much more than a history of just collecting the indigenous. Elizabeth takes on a profound challenge that relates in many ways to our project here today. She traces the ways in which Native American and American art and art history became intellectually and commercially separated, walled off from each other. 
And she questions, as Joan does for the French Ancien Regime, are two facile distinctions between art and craft. Her talk today takes us to the contemporary Southwest and to the work of sculptor, writer, and filmmaker Nora Naranjo Morse, two of whose children's books, I should note, are part of Caroline's collection. We look forward to this final talk pushing us to and beyond American frontiers. Thank you so much. Um, so that I changed the title of my talk to a quotation from an essay in the Leslie Marmon Silco book, Rain, that's on display downstairs. Um, the quote is, through our stories, we hear where we are, which I thought was a, was a sort of nice discovery. So that's what you would see um, if, if I had programmed my presentation correctly. <clears throat> I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank the audience for hanging out on a Friday afternoon. Um, it hasn't even rained to force you be in, to be inside yet. I want to recognize that we are on indigenous land and honor the Lenape and the other indigenous peoples who pass through this place, past, present, and future. When I reached out to Nora Naranjo Morse to speak about the work at the center of this talk, she was busy maintaining it. Her email back to me evoked the indigenous understanding of the reciprocal relationships between people in the land exercised through ongoing acts of care and particularly the work of Pueblo women intending the landscape and cultural structures derived from the earth, namely pottery and architecture. And uh, in, in Pueblo culture, women are the architects and the people who um, sustain the architecture, although, although men can participate in both pottery and architecture as well. In today's talk, I'd like to explore how Nombe Huage offers a gendered engagement with the Western landscape that reaches across generations and history into the past and the future that is meaningful to attend to in our current moment of questioning what we memorialize in America and how we do so. And I will do this by grounding the piece in the writing of Pueblo author Leslie Marmon Silco, whose 1996 artist book, Rain, is on view downstairs. Nombe Huaga is one of two parts of Albuquerque's Cuarto Centenario Monument, memorializing the arrival of conquistador Don Juan Oñate's party of Spanish settlers in the region in 1598. The other piece, La Jornada, let's see if I have a detail of it, I don't. Um, it's in the back of this here. Um, is a multi-figure bronze installation by Latinx sculptor Reynaldo Sonny Rivera and Anglo painter and sculptor Betty Sabo, representing the settlement party, humans and livestock, arrayed on a man-made bluff just to the east of Nambihuaga. Nambihuaga was hurt in a fire last spring. At first, Nora was concerned it was vandalism, as there had been a protest around the same time nearby, during which parts of La Jornada were defaced. But it turned out it was just some teenage boys smoking some stuff. Nambihuaga lost a tree and other plants, but the city of Albuquerque is supporting its restoration, which makes Nora happy. The city of Albuquerque has not always been a great supporter of this project. Even when it isn't damaged, Nambihuaga is a piece that requires attention, made as it is out of earth and stones and indigenous plants, and sited in a part of the world prone to drought and high winds and flash floods. And this is just a still from a film that Nora made of the sculpture in the year um, that it was installed, showing her transplanting a yucca um, onto the site. All of the stones and plants were, were placed there by hand and relocated from other places and, um, and took some time to take root and get established. Not that the work is supposed to be kept in an unchanging state, so not that kind of maintenance, quite the contrary. As the seasons change, the plants bud and bloom and thin out, attracting the birds and butterflies and rabbits who have developed alongside them in the desert southwest. But Numbehuaga is a kind of art, some have called it land art, that Nora expects to maintain when she produces it. It is the first of several works, uh, another notable one being Always Becoming at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC, and a new series of works um, focused on using public art to challenge viewers to protect sacred landscapes through an engagement with the materials, 
forms, iconography of the land itself and the land itself, and through her own and other humans' interaction with these materials. And these are just some scenes from a recent um, extension of the Always Becoming project in Washington, D.C., where she engaged uh, museum members and other people from the community in actually building the pieces. Uh, museum guards contributed stones from their own yards to be integrated into the mud. Um, that made up these, these structures that populate the landscape around the museum. In these details, in the fact that they ch these, these monuments change over time and that it invites interaction by humans, Nimbihuaga contains aspects of what Phil Young has called a counter monument. Young's work takes as a jumping off point Lewis Mumford's critique, and this is one of his examples of a counter monument, one that he celebrates. Um, he takes as a jumping off point Lewis Mumford's critique of monuments as resolving historic trauma using familiar tropes. As Young writes, quote, the counter monument's aim is not to console, but to provoke, not to remain fixed, but to change, not to be everlasting, but to disappear, not to be ignored by its passers-by, but to demand interaction, not to remain pristine, but to invite its own violation and desecration, not to accept graciously the burden of memory, but to throw it back at the town's feet. By defining itself in opposition to the traditional memorial's task, the Contra Monument illustrates concisely the possibilities and limitations of all memorials everywhere. In this way, it functions as a valuable counter-index to the ways time, memory, and current in history intersect at any memorial site. And this is uh, Esther Shalov Gertz's Monument Against Fascism, which disappeared slowly over a period of several years, sinking into the ground, um, but before it disagreed, Appeared. The soft lead-covered surface was uh, a site that invited inscriptions of uh, the visitors to have their own reactions to um, what what they would like to remember um, about fascism, so that it uh, did not return. And these are the Puya cliff, cliff dwellings that were mentioned earlier today. They are on Santa Clara Pueblo land um, and an, a vital reference point for Santa Clara Pueblo people. And I'll just point out um, that there's many um, inscriptions by ancestral Pueblo people on them. And here's a spiral that mimics the shape of Nambehuage. Nora Naranjo Morse is not particularly interested in intervening in a broad discourse about monuments. Instead, she wants to give material form to what she calls Pueblo thinking, an approach to the world that starts from the land base. Her primary audience for her work is the Pueblo community, and in general, she hopes that her work will challenge indigenous communities to protect their land. She is a Tewa woman. She grew up and still lives at Santa Clara Pueblo, one of the six Tewa-speaking Pueblos along the Rio Grande in New Mexico. The seventh uh, Tewa-speaking Pueblo is on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. Naranjo Morse comes from a family known for making exquisite pottery using the distinctive Santa Clara black on black technique, but her own oeuvre is more conceptual and she frequently produces installation and site specific works for museums and galleries as well as her public art. In Pueblo communities, the artistic practice Naranjo Morse is exercising at Nambehuaga is key to her expression of culturally specific femininity forged in relationship with a particular Western landscape of, the Pueblo, of Pueblo country on the Colorado Plateau. As a central background to my talk is the fact that this relationship has been continually renewed across centuries of human history in this region in the face of many social changes. And I'll just point out the first time I heard Nora speak, she um, was actually talking about uh, and showed pictures of the clay mine that she uses to get the earth that she uses in her work and that her family has used for their pottery for generations. And the, it's a location that is passed down intergenerationally um, and, and is on uh, on her community's territory, um, and that's uh, that's women's knowledge that uh, that she shares, and of course all of the rituals that go along with gathering, being grateful and offering the prayers and gathering the materials at the appropriate time of year and offering the appropriate blessings while she is making her work are all things that have migrated into what she calls her gallery or conceptual work from pottery and architecture traditions. Um, so even though it doesn't look the same, um, it's grounded in a continuation of those traditions. Nora's understanding of the need for this kind of work grew out of her participation in the Cuarto Centenario project. 
The conception of a memorial here dates to the 1990s as the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Spanish settlers in New Mexico approached a cultural effort, um, approached a cultural effort that was begun by citizens associated with Latinx business and social organizations and eventually endorsed by the city political leadership and overseen by the Albuquerque Arts Board. Seeking to overcome what they saw as a negative bias against Latinx people in the Southwest derived from the black legend, which emphasized the brutality and intolerance of conquistadors, advocates for a Cuatro Centenario Memorial in Albuquerque wanted to stress the contributions made by colonists to the development of New Mexico, such as the bringing of livestock, cattle, and sheep, new plants and technologies, and a contribution in the eyes of some Christianity. As in other places in New Mexico, advocates for an Albuquerque memorial wanted the project to center on the figure of the conquistador Oñate. The proposal met with resistance, however, due to Oñate's controversial history, particularly his involvement in violent retaliation against Acoma Pueblo after a party of young Acoma men killed 12 Spanish soldiers, including Oñate's nephew, in a conflict over Acoma resistance to paying the required tribute of food to the Spanish. In response, the Spaniard led an attack of the Acoma Mesa, Mesa that resulted in the death of hundreds of people, the enslavement of many surviving men, women, and children, and the punishment of 20 young men of fighting age by amputating their right feet. Oñate was later tried for these acts in New Mexico City and banished from New Mexico for life. A monument to Oñate uh, that had been created near Española actually um, in Alcalde, which also came up in, um, in the talk earlier today, um, had been vandalized almost as soon as it had been made. The conquistador's foot had been cut off. The maker, uh, the, the, the sculptor actually instantly made a, a replacement and um, sutured it back on, so he was never amputated, although I will tell you that lately, Oñate's feet have been painted red again and again in more recent protests. And at the right, um, the foot reemerged actually a couple of years ago. Chris Eyre, the filmmaker, had been one of the perpetrators of the initial vandalism. Uh, the Albuquerque Arts Board attempted to avoid such conflict by appointing a committee of three artists for this project. They also held many public fora to solicit community input. However, the artists were unable to develop a single coherent monument that was acceptable to all, and as a result, the Cuarto Centenario Memorial has two parts. And this is, again, um, just a diagram, but you can see the La Jornada over on the edge there, and this is Nambehuague. Um, the long and difficult path that led to this resolution has been discussed well elsewhere. I point you in particular to Allison Field's article in the winter 2011 issue of the Public Historian, which argues that this monument's inability to create a successful representation of colonial history is the result of the fact that, that, colonial, that the historical trauma of colonialism in the region has not yet been resolved. Many indigenous people opposed the monument project, and in the course of public debate, many who had never learned about the Akama massacre gained familiarity with a history their relatives had suppressed out of fear that such violence could return. As Nora relates it, the realization of this fact was catalyzing. She had been expected, when invited to this project, to offer input into the tableau that would recognize Pueblo presence at the time of Spanish conquest and fold figures of Pueblo people into a larger composition. The solution that she and the other artists agreed on initially was the incorporation of several pairs of empty moccasins and one single shoe to indicate the mutilation of Akama men, but this was rejected by the Arts Council as too controversial. Nora uh, could, would not be convinced to contribute anything else to the tableau. While many Pueblo people with whom she spoke wanted her to, wanted her to make bronze figures of Pueblo people for the work, um, speaking back to history in its same formal language, she came to the conclusion that this would give the wrong message by depicting colonization as something from the past. Over the course of the work on the project, she came to understand that the indigenous experience of settler colonialism was ongoing, that the wounds of this history had not healed, and that contemporary cultural relations in the Southwest continued to be informed by cultural bias and misunderstanding. One might say that she came to understand that, as scholar Patrick Wolfe has put it, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. In the film she made about Nambehuaga, Naranjo Morse explains 
coming to see the, quote, difference in how we see history and how we see our positions in history. She committed herself to something more conceptual that would speak to historical presence as embedded in a living environment, quote, related to who we are then and now. Numbehuaga means our center place in Tiwa. And it begins with a center place, a reflective pond emerging uh, from the earth and reflecting the sky. The interior of the bork is several feet below street level, and the viewer must wind around a spiraling path to emerge, encountering the sights, sounds, and smells of the bosques and meadows of the Rio Grande Valley. As one winds up closer to street level, she first encounters the legs of the figure of La Jornada, and eventually faces a missile erected on the grounds of the nearby New National Atomic Museum. Different eras coincide in Nomehuaga. The plants and rocks have been brought here to work together and to connect this small plot of land in the city center to a broader landscape with which Pueblo people have lived and interacted for generations. Some of the rocks include petroglyphs made by ancestral people. As Silco relates in Landscape, History, and the Pueblo Imagination, an essay included in her book, Rain, petroglyphs are the expressions of a Pueblo understanding of the relationship between people and land. Quote, Pueblo potters, the creators of petroglyphs and oral narratives, never conceived of removing themselves from the earth and sky. Standing deep within the natural world, the ancient Pueblo understood the thing as it was. The squash blossom, grasshopper, or rabbit itself could never be created by a human hand. And so when they made works, um, they didn't depict them, but allowed them to speak for themselves, to bring out the, quote, spiritual or mythic dimension of the Pueblo world, even today. Immersed in Numbehuaga, the viewer is inserted into the landscape of a very Pueblo, in a very Pueblo way. Again, quoting Silco, for Pueblo people, viewers are as much a part of the landscape as the boulders they stand on, and human consciousness remains within the hills, canyons, cliff, plants, and clouds, and sky. Naranjo Morse describes her work as conceptual, but it also trades in the Im imagery of petroglyphs and pottery, represented here in the work of 20th century Pueblo artist Pueblita Velarde, also from Santa Clara, who in this work brings together geometric abstractions of natural forces and inviting the plants and creatures of the desert to move across her terrestrial canvas. This is a, a painting made of earth pigments, and you can see the spiral is also the beak of a parrot um, that some of the images seem to reflect either clouds or, um, or uh, the sides of hills and cliffs. In the film she made about Numbehuaga, Naranjo Morse tells us, quote, it is something, it says something about who we are as native people, holding on to what the ancestors say is important, the land, resources. What is interesting to me is the way in which Numbehuaga enacts a kind of time travel, not by leaping from one moment to another, but by embedding the current lived experience of the visitor in a sense of the ongoing presence of land. This idea is fundamental to Pueblo thinking. Silco relates how when family and friends come together, they begin by recounting recent events, but this leads to the recitation of older tales of what transpired in the same locations and invites the rehearsal of ancient creation stories that gave rise to the names of those same places. Storytelling offers the opportunity to take what Silco calls an interior journey across the expanse of time to reunite with beloved family members and ancestors who also lived through the natural and human events that characterize the desert landscape. While it is not quite right to call the Pueblo landscape a wilderness or a frontier, words so important to today's conference, it is a challenging terrain, and the relationship between Pueblo people and the land has been essential for their survival. Again, quoting Silco, quote, interrelationships in the Pueblo landscape are complex and fragile. The unpredictability of the weather, the aridity and harshness of much of the terrain in the high plateau country explain in large part the relentless attention the Pueblo people gave to the sky and earth around them. Survival depended upon harmony and cooperation, not only among human beings, but among all things, the animate and the less animate, since rocks and mountains were known to move to travel occasionally. This kind of cooperation, uh, like Naranjo Morse's 
counter monuments demands for maintenance and interaction might be productively connected with a feminist ethics of care. And I was so delighted to hear in Lucy's talk that the words of care coming up in this idea of healing. I use this term less to invoke the moral philosophical traditions of Carol Gilgan and her followers who've developed uh, this idea of an ethics of care to describe the responsibility to recognize and meet the needs of others in ways that intersect with gender, but rather want to connect with how care has been discussed in indigenous studies uh, though it is worth noting that in Pueblo thinking, the land is gendered female and associated with the fertility of a woman's body that gives maternal care to the people. And so perhaps Gilligan would also be happy with my use of this. Non-native anthropologist Lisa Stevenson proposes a version of the ethics of care as a way to heal intergenerational colonial trauma in her work in the Canadian Arctic. She suggests the value of committing to caregiving that embraces uncertainty and the possibility that things cannot, that cannot be re neatly resolved. She describes this uncertainty as productive and even hopeful, even if really understanding Inuit experience can only happen in a partial, halting way. I'm not sure I put this well, but um, what Stevenson is suggesting, and what is certainly also true in Silko's fantastic novel, Ceremony, is that there is mysterious healing to be made available through embracing what might seem to non-native caregivers as superstition or lore or practices that cannot be proven by medical science to be uh, leading to physical health. Put simply, Stevenson, um, connected the youth with whom she worked with their own tribal traditions and saw this as offering them a path to healing that was both literal and figurative. For Silco and Naranjo Morse, we might see their focus on the Pueblo landscape's center places as playing that same ambiguous role and to think about how their care for the earth could also be a means of caring for their community. Significantly, Stevenson uses the term image uh, to describe these superstitions or these ambiguous uh, concepts that are essential to this work, borrowing the term for, from Walter Benjamin's description of fragmented concepts or memories th through which we think and live to discuss the potential power of indigenous cultural traditions to achieve things that might appear to the colonial mind as supernatural. She writes, quote, images are useful precisely because they can capture uncertainty and contradiction without having to resolve it. Like Stevenson's work, Numbewage might be seen as an image that productively probes the boundary between the observable and measurable material world and uh, raises the healing potential of a more metaphysical Pueblo thinking. One of the adjustments made to La Jornada during the development of the Cuarto Centenario project was the decision to include several images of women and children in the party of settlers. And this has been celebrated as giving a richer and more accurate picture of New Mexican pioneers. So these are women on the frontier, but I want to focus back on the Pueblo women on the frontier who are always arriving always uh, uh, retelling a story of their people's emergence into this land, but telling it in a different way. Pueblo people look to a different mo moment of arrival in the Southwest as their essential history. It is the story of the people's migration from another world into this one, a story in which the ancestral figures of corn women and reed women played essential roles in the people's survival. Um, and one that, that comes up again in these repeated intergenerational acts. So these are Nora's daughters um, actually restoring some of her works. Rena Swensel, a Tewa scholar from Santa Clara, links the connection Pueblo people have to the land with the fact that it is the site of this historic emergence. Quote, at the center of the Pueblo belief system is the conviction that people are not separate from nature and natural forces. This insoluble connection with nature has existed from the beginning of time. After emerging from the darkness of the earth, the people founded their worlds by first finding the centers. Through her message, though her message is to Pueblo people, Nora Naranjo Morse challenges us to continually find our center places if we want to heal from historic traumas um, and celebrate the women who have already done this. Thank you very much.
Thank you both. Question, Melissa. Um, Joan, I just had some questions about some of the categories and terminology mm -hmm. uh, when you said the, the women were enslaved and the slaves were freed. There were enslaved women, yes? Were there enslaved women in Natchez? Oh, no, they were, but he, they, this is someone describing what Oh, I know, happened. but I'm just making the point, of course, that the women, the, the Euro, the, the French women were taken captive and the, or they were kept captive in the enslaved women, right? I guess it was just I the category. I that there were enslaved women left in that. There had been perhaps some initially, although I'm not sure. Natchez is a tiny, tiny, tiny okay. French settlement, you may have gathered. And I'm not sure that there were any enslaved um, European women or native women at Natchez. Or Afri I was thinking African. I was, I was African women, yes, but he's talking about African slaves in a separate category, men and Right, women. but I was making the point that in your categories that the enslaved women are also women, right? Yes. Yes. I'm yes. Not, I'm okay. Someone. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I can't. But I guess the other the the other question then had to do with the idea that she became a Choctaw slave, and it's not clear to me she was a, continued to be held captive, but she was not uh, an enslaved. I'm yeah. Once again. Again. Okay. Maybe that just wasn't clear in context. It sounded like, yeah. So just a point about intersectionality. That was my my point. She was when you say a Choctaw, and they were calling her a slave, the French, because she had the less freedom at that point, they were saying, than the slaves had had in Natchez before. I hope, I'm sorry. I okay. So when you say a person is a Choctaw slave, it means that someone in the Choctaw tribe is enslaving that person? Well, she was held captive, and the description made by those recording this was that she was a slave of the Choctaws. Because, right. I mean, the Cherokee did have that situation in Georgia, and some of the African slaves did come with them on the Trail of Tears. I wonder. I wondered if it was a parallel, if you were making that No, point. no, 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 no. I was simply quoting. I'm trying. I'm sorry. It's really, you know, 20 minutes to do a yes. case with a lot of terminology in a lot of languages that's tough. I was probably politically incorrect 95 times per second during that, but I'm just trying to record something. And to record, for well, me, what's interesting is to have contemporary reactions to this at, I, I, it, it certainly suggests some of the European confusion about what captivity uh, meant in native context. And we know this uh, from many, from many uh, so American the situations. Is that they're not taking acceptive sides on any of this. Uh, and it's constantly, it's for example, when it was all over, you would have expected total revenge on the part of the French. The Natchez who had survived came forward and asked for mercy. The French had first said no. The women who had been captive, including Marie Baron, came forward and said, free them. We want them freed, so they were freed. I mean, it was, they, the, everyone realized this was a complicated situation. Natchez was 40, 20 soldiers, huge indigenous populations all around, many more African slaves than European anything, they're living, they all speak a shared language, Mobilian, up and down, they're doing, they're living together. They didn't think of themselves as completely separate in here. Oh, this was a, a quite a fluid, tiny little community. It was not like the larger French settlements. This was, this was a speck, oh, and it was, gets wiped out. This is the end. Mobilian was the trade language a, of the whole yeah, valley. It's a trade jargon. Yeah, a little bit of French, a little bit of Spanish, lots of indigenous words. Hi, Joan. I just wanted to know where the illustration of the manuscript map came from. Her husband. But the second husband. <laughs> it's in, he also did handwritten. He did, it's, it's quite wonderful, two copies. One is here, one is in Paris. Two huge uh, poems about... Louisiana, uh, 60,000 lines of poetry about Louisiana with handwritten maps and, man and drawings. And he did the drawing of the fort and all the, the houses and everything. So that's a detail from that. And when Joan says he or she means the new Joe, right? 
No, the, the, the Newberry has a huge collection. There's the Newberry has the has his memoirs with many more maps and descriptions. There is at the at the um, in Washington at the Library of Congress. There's one of these poems, these epic poems, and there's a bigger one in Paris, which he sent to the nephew of the man who had signed deportation orders on many of the women who was in power. There's no overt gesture of settling of scores, but you know he was thinking of it when it was done. Uh, so that's there dedicated to him. Uh, he left stuff everywhere. He was incredibly prolific. I don't know where he got his training. He's a soldier, but there he is. Thank you so much. This was such a great session. Um, I wonder, Elizabeth, if you could comment at all, maybe elaborate a little bit, if you can, on the Pueblo conversation with Nora about her work. And um, you suggested the moccasins, I think, that maybe she didn't go with. But can you elaborate on that process and the voices that she had to entertain and sort of how she resolved or what decisions yeah. she made? Thank I, you. I think when Nora was invited to join this project, she was a young, not particularly well-known artist who was really excited to get a public commission. And she was also uh, really impressed that tax money would go to pay an indigenous artist to make a monumental work. Um, so that was in the, in the mid-90s. And, um, and so the, in the lead up, around 90, well, the project began in the mid-90s. She was probably, she was invited last, and she, may have, she thinks she was invited as an afterthought. Um, so, uh, so she hadn't done a lot of deep thinking about what it would actually mean to participate in this project. Uh, and she instantly got pulled into um, a very controversial set of conversations within the community. There was some very strong opposition among Pueblo people to even having this monument occur, including uh, a local news anchor who was a Hopi man, um, who was showing up at every, um, at every meeting and saying, no monument at all. And, uh, but she had already been put into this position of, um, of uh, being part of the, um, of the team. And so she was trying to find a way to kind of thread the needle. And the way that she came up with to thread the needle was to put bronze moccasins that would speak to basically native genocide and law, culture loss and really speak to. Um, but she, she said even in her own education, um, when she'd studied the history of New Mexico, the conquistadors had been celebrated. Nobody talked about the Acoma massacre. Um, nobody talked about Pope and the Pueblo revolt. For those of you who don't know New Mexico history, about 100 years after Oñate, um, the Pueblo communities actually collaborated, worked together, and um, drove the Spanish out and were able to hold them out of New Mexico for um, upwards of 10 years. Um, and it's, uh, it was a, um, a period of political organization that established Pueblo ties that um, re-emerged historically in different moments. So um, uh, a similar kind of consolidated communication and resistance emerged in the 1920s in uh, response to the Burson Bill, which was a bill that would have outlawed uh, indigenous dancing at the time as, um, and then has a very interesting um, successful end partially because they decided that even though dancing wasn't necessarily religious that um, they, they would go with the Bill of Rights as the reason for, um, for saving their practices. Um, so so she, she, she conceded that she would do the moccasins and, uh, and people found that too controversial. And um, she was actually ordered into mediation. Everybody just wanted her to make some Pueblo bronze people standing, maybe weeping, right? Maybe calling us back to 1971 in the Keep America Beautiful campaign. Some some little nostalgic thing that could make people feel like, okay, we're really sad that the that the Indian people lost out in this settlement thing. Let's move on now. And she realized that moving on was just not helpful for anyone. And so it was at that point that she, um, she made the landscape that's adjacent to it, that instead of telling that history, went back to ancestral history and, and called it into the present. But there are, there are several articles that tell that whole story. And of course, I could have used 20 minutes and still not told that whole story well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to now. One of the ways that your 
papers, which are of course so different in many ways, do speak to each other is on this big vast topic of memory. And I wondered, although it is a huge question, of course, if you could offer a couple of thoughts on on memory and your own work here, memory in the sense simply you have memoir, the title of Dumont's text. Um, we have a problem of archives. Um, we have the whole issue of monument and commemoration and remembering in the present. So if either or both of you have some thoughts to offer on, on the big topic of memory. Well, I think, you know, I chose to use the concept of time in my essay um, to bring out the, um, the concept that I, I think is maybe best articulated by Vine Deloria of how um, because indigenous uh, culture is centered on place instead of time, um, history is always present. In, in every moment that you dwell in the same place. Um, but I think memory could be equally meaningful to thinking through that. Um, and yet what's so interesting to me about Nora's story was the suppression of colonial memory, that she really talked to people who were experiencing anew the horror at the loss of their ancestors. When, I mean, you all gasped, right? You all gasped when I told that story. And so imagine if that happened to your community. Um, and, um, and so even, um, it, it, the recovery of memory, I think, is an important piece of what she's trying to do to get people to to go through that recovery, but to get go through it in a consoling kind of place, right? Grounded and connected to the fact that um, that Pueblo history has had many devastating incidents, and not all of them at the hands of non-native people. Some of them at the hands of a storm, or a fire, or a drought, or a famine, um, and that this is. Um, that, that, the, that the lesson is to, to reconnect to the fundamental principles, or as she calls it, protect what's sacred. That's very strong, and I'd like to put down as a, as a hunter. Yeah, but I mean, of course, it, you know, the, the battles that are going on in New Mexico now, and there's current battles now, too, about remembering Spanish colonial history, I think are battles in which many, many memories are competing, right? In the same way that in the battles over Confederate monuments, one of the things that's coming up is that that Southerners are are saying we're not allowed to remember our own stories, um, and 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 the suppression of those memories as well. Not the not the memories of the horrors of enslavement, but the fact that you know there are other stories too that are also suppressed if you shut down an entire history. Um, uh, in in New Mexico, Latinos are not necessarily um, uh, free of racism and bias and marginalization, and so their desire to tell those histories and allow those memories to come back into the fore is also tied to all of this. I mean, cultural memory. There's probably we spill more blood over that than than many other things. <laughs> I only care about one thing. The French have repressed this entire story, and that's it's just not right. Uh, the women are everywhere. The, the, you can have a descendant uh, of one of them married to someone speaking at this conference. Doesn't surprise me. I was, they had, uh, Marie Baron was unusual. Four children only, it's nothing. Some of them had 12 uh, with multiple husbands, and many of their children had nine or 10 children, and they've spread out over a number of states. So, and most of those people still remember the stories about the prostitutes in their families. And truly, I've not found one woman who can clearly be called a prostitute. From, there are stories on, at times, but the woman always has a counter story, which is absolutely convincing, and they wanted prostitutes. So no one in France had ever arrested prostitutes before this started. The word exists, of course. They talked about loose women, women of low morals, debauched women, etc. All of a sudden, in the files, I've done 19 years of every sheet of every police file left in Paris, and all of a sudden, late 1718, there are prostitutes everywhere. Everyone's a prostitute, and they're arresting them. You know, they're coming all the time. Goes on 1719, prost nothing but prostitutes. Early 1720, a few after that, gone. And so it's not, the French are not upset about this. And all of a sudden, this is this moment, and they manage to get, if you're unlucky, you end up on the boat. I know it's, yeah, anyway. Let's thank our speakers.
Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers today. Um, it's, been, it's, it's been a wonderful day, and we have uh, the rest of it to um, truly enjoy ourselves. So I'm just going to introduce uh, the four people around this square table, and I'm going to start with, with uh, Kathleen Cahill. Uh, she teaches at Penn State University. She is the author of Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1932, which won the Labriola Center American Indian National Book Award. Um, Kathleen is a social historian who explores the everyday experiences of ordinary people, primarily women. She focuses on women's working and political lives, asking how identities such as race, nationality, class and age have shaped them. She is currently engaged in two book projects, Joining the Parade, Women of Colour, Challenge the Mainstream Suffrage Movement, and Indians on the Road, Gender, Race and Regional Identity, which reimagines the West Coast through the lens of indigenous people's relationships with the transportation systems that bisected their land. Mm. Kate Hunter, mm. raised in Perth, Western Australia, <laughs> uh, grew up surrounded by books, her family having been book collectors for generations. Her first Roper book job, proper, proper book job, <laughs> <laughs> was working that's your spelling mistake, not mine, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> was working summer vacations on the front desk at the Waterfields Bookshop by the railway station in Oxford, misdirecting American tourists <laughs> to the university. <laughs> she began working in the modern book department at Mags Brothers Limited in 1988 before opening her own small business from home in Cambridge in England. Uh, in 2007, she moved to New York to work in Christie's book department and she is now the senior specialist at the New York Gallery of Daniel Crouch Rare Books and curator of the Map and Atlas Museum of La Jolla, California. Mm. Regan Cladstrup began reading American fiction aged about four underneath a blanket with <laughs> a bar of chocolate. Mm. Uh, she got her degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and while there, she started to work at Penn Libraries, inspecting people's bags before they left the building. <laughs> and she's been working at the University of Pennsylvania ever since, cataloging their books. I started working, oh, in 2013, she became director of the Special Collections Processing Center at, at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, and I started working for her in the same year. Yeah. <laughs> I built her a room, I found her a manuscripts cataloger, I found her a rare books cataloger, and together with David McKnight, I found her a collector whose collection she fell in love with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the rest, and the rest is history. I couldn't find a biography for Caroline Schimmel, and I don't <laughs> have the nerve to write one. <laughs> so I thought I could start by asking her some questions. Oh. Well, I know that you were a cowgirl by 1946. <laughs> My mother dressed me up as one. That didn't mean I was one, or I had any opinion about it at the time, except it looks like I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> if you look really closely, my sister says I'm trying about to smile, but I think I'm about to burst into tears. Well, imagine having that gun, you know, blocking against your leg. Right. Yeah. yeah, so physical conflict's always been important to you, actually. Is it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So when did you start getting interested in the extremes of discomfort that the that you that that are typical of the women whose interests you're supposed to I wasn't to interested except I was curious as to why any of these women would have thought they were in a happy state. <laughs> 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 you know, they they wrote glowingly about some of them about going through a rainstorm in the Grand Canyon or whatever, I mean, seriously? <laughs> but then I thought, okay, whatever was happening to them, and this is a theme throughout all of my 
24,000 votes. <coughs> Whatever had priorly happened to them was worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Whether it was, um, I don't know, the first husband of Eliza Young being a real SOB, so that uh, Brigham wasn't so bad until she started living with him. You know, it, yes. it's, it's, it's a matter of gradations and so forth. And then people like Anne Bancroft uh, <coughs> and Leave Arnson, who went to the Arctic, the Antarctic, these are just basically cheery people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know many people like that. Reagan is a basically cheery person. And it's, <laughs> it's like, it, but they're, they're so few of them. So. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, and so I was, I was, this is like a socio-psycho investigation into <laughs> what's up with this. Right. <laughs> and, and was your interest in these women, did, 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 was this, did this begin before you were interested in books, or, is, or, was, mm -hmm. or, was, or was it books first? What was your, what did you first read? What was it the was, first book you was, remember it reading? It was, well, I, of course I read those orange books when we were kids, the, the, the whether it was Davy Crockett or whatever, all the spines were orange, <laughs> and they were about this tall in the library, and they were all together. <laughs> so I worked my way through those, and there were air hosts and so forth. And then I, I grew up, and I ignored them, but it was a confluence of the women's movement, the American Civilization Department here, um, being taught bibliography at the library company by Ed mm -hmm. Wolf, and I suddenly, I looked around and I thought, I know something no nobody else does, which is how to find a book and buy it. <laughs> 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 and and it, was, it was, a lot of it was just sheer luck, it was just circumstances, and it's been happy circumstances throughout my life since, you know, meeting somebody and realizing they knew someone who could Know, give me a book about somebody or be a relative of somebody like like what happened today with Mademoiselle Baron and, mm. and Bordelin. Mm. <laughs> um, and Ameri the American Civ course was incredibly important to you, wasn't it, as a as a sort of an intellectual? It was it because not just the topic, which was well, I. I was a very confused young adult, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And Tony Garvin said to me, he was the head of the department, he said, Caroline, you can study astronomy because the stars are over America. <laughs> so that was how fluid or non-existent the <laughs> structure was for 12 courses in American civilization. And I just embraced it wholly. And I've spoken to people my own age who were in the department or had um, roommates who were, and to a person, they said it was a lifesaver for a person who did not want since they were six to become an accountant mm. or a whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely. Good. Which is why Penn dropped it. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the uh, biography of Caroline Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I started reading at the age of three with a nightlight. Uh, uh, I would lay on the floor about. where my mom had left the nightlight because I pretended to be scared of the dark, so I could read, and they couldn't <laughs> see it because their bedroom was on the other side of that wall. Uh, I wasn't allowed to have a nightlight. Just a chocolate bar. Just a but chocolate bar. You had a chocolate bar. I had a chocolate I wasn't bar. Fed. Yeah, no, I wasn't given any. <laughs> 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 so, and we have around this table, we have an academic, a librarian, a collector, and a bookseller. And, and I'm a librarian. Uh, two librarians. <laughs> Are you a book collector, Kate? Right two book collectors. Are you a book three collector? Books. Three. I mean, four. I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you acquire books. I, I just work you all, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> And, and this is the ecosystem that makes that makes that makes up the modern the modern book book world. And so we have four different perspectives on on on, on this collecting scene. And Kate, how long have you known Caroline? Really long time since 1986. 
Um, I was working in a tiny little bookshop in London on the corner of Prince's Arcade and Piccadilly, and it was about the size of a goldfish bowl. And there's definitely more space on this table than there was in the <laughs> shop. And um, it was a travel bookshop, Cavendish Rare Books, run by Barbara Grigor Taylor, who was, and I think has only ever been, the only very successful female bookseller in London's West End. I mean, you could go up and down, Cecil Court up and down, um, forgotten, uh, Charing Cross Road, and all in Mayfair, Golden Square, and it's all men. Hmm. But in her little shop, she had a stock of mountaineering books, travel books, voyages. She had Jane Robinson working for her, who wrote a book called Wayward Women, using Caroline's collection. And she was there at the same time as I was. And there was me being a little fledgling bookseller, sitting at the, the front desk. The door was here, had a bell on it, so that Barbara knew when people were coming in. And it had a lock on it which meant, sure, nobody could get out <laughs> unless <laughs> Barbara pressed a button. Um, and I was probably ignoring what was going on. You were there with Stuart, and it had been a very successful visit, and I was sitting there typing away, thinking, any minute now I'm going to be asked to press the buzzer to let you out. And Stuart suddenly slams his hand <laughs> on the table and attracts my attention like this, and um, says, good luck, girl, because you're going to need it. And um, it was, it was, you know, a, a, a thing, a, a moment that I have never forgotten. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were completely different, not just for that reason, but in every way from her usual customer, who tended to be a gentleman in a bowler hat with a furled umbrella, who who came in during his um, lunch hour. Um, you certainly were. I was trying to remember today if, while I was at Barbara's, I'd met any other women collectors mm -hmm. who collected anything. And I think the only other person who would count remotely was an academic called Penny Smith, who was at Oxford. Do you remember her? Oh. For a time, she was um, around, but for the rest of them were all um, men. Then we, you might have been living in London at that point. Yeah, but you, you have omitted that Barbara not only sold, but did. Oh, yes, she did. She was a woman traveler herself. She climbed mountains. She had... She went halfway up Everest, yeah. as I recall. She, she, she climbed K2. She had just climbed... She'd just come back from climbing K2 when I started um, working for her. And um, she, her first... Her starter marriage had been to a descendant of an Australian explorer called um, Sturt. Yeah, and she had gone out to New Zealand with him where he lived and had decided that she'd had enough of him. And the only way back she could afford, and also it was an excuse for a really good adventure, was on a cargo ship. So she travelled by cargo ship all the way um, back to the UK. She's actually Californian. And, um, yeah, so she so was she intrepid was in many first, ways. She was my first adventurer that I ever met. Real life Real adventure. Life rest. And, and yes. Pretty extraordinary then and now. Um, so you were probably living in London, which is why I knew you, why you were there. And thereafter, I went to work at Mags, and you and Stuart were customers of Mags. And then we my probably lost touch. My husband was a book collector. My second husband, not my starter. Not husband. your starter. <laughs> husband. Well, and, your, and, and your second husband, if I remember, if, if I understand this right, he was a collector of expensive books while you were you were a collector of cheap ones. Is that is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but he was the one who had the money. I, I do <laughs> yes, I do get an allowance every year, and he used to be pissed off if I bought my sister's birthday presents instead of buying <coughs> something. I don't know what. Anyway, um, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is about finances yeah. and other things. Yes, mm -hmm. and if I bought a, a book that was expensive, I had to smuggle it in-house. Need to know basis. So need to know. Yes. Well, yeah. If I buy something expensive, I have to smuggle it in my house. So <laughs> times have changed. But um, <laughs> one of the one of the um, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, Kathleen's on the panel because one of the things that I think is uh, 
really wonderful about your collecting is the, is the extent to which you're sort of really engaged with the academic community uh, in, in, in this particular area. And that's, and that's not always the case with collectors. It's funny because we have Mark Samuels Lasmer here today who's, who, who, who's, exactly, who's exactly that for his discipline too. Um, but Kathleen, how much is your work, has your work historically been dependent upon uh, private collectors? Is it well, I mean, the, the point that was just made about how most of these collections were collected by men, I think, really stands when I was thinking about the collection and looking at all these books, and it's a phenomenal, I mean, just, I loved being in, in the display there. Um, I'm used to seeing them in, in libraries like the Newberry or the Huntington or the De Goyer at Southern Methodist University where they were collected by men. Um, and to have a collection put together by a woman that focuses on women is just phenomenal. Um, and I, you know, many of the themes in the papers today, um, you know, talking about the archive and the, sometimes the difficulty of finding women's voices and to have them all brought together in one place is, is really amazing, right? And so as an academic, I'm used to encountering them um, in archives that were primarily built by men. Right. And so this is very exciting. You should also just mention the coalition. I was going to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for him to ask me how I knew Carolyn. But um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. I met Carolyn um, through something called the Coalition for Western Women's History, um, which exactly has this um, agenda. Uh, of bringing women's history and women's voices into Western history, which has traditionally been right a very male field, and Renee is also uh, one of the members. And David. And David comes to our breakfast. I don't know if he, <laughs> do you pay membership dues, David? <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a. <laughs> um, but so the, I met Carolyn through that organization, and she has been um, a member possibly longer than I have. Uh, Please tell why, why you exist, had to exist. Because women were being ignored. Um, I think, no? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> so it, exactly, in 1983, um, the women at the Western History Association were so fed up with um, sort of the lack of interest and recognition of women's history, that they held their own conference um, and decided to form the coalition to encourage uh, this kind of scholarship. And it is so has been going strong. We're celebrating and our 35th. Early on, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. You would have you would have thought you would you know <laughs> I don't know threatening mm -hmm. male <laughs> history. Mm -hmm. It's like widening mm. the, the, the casting, the net wider. Mm. But no, no, Umbridge was taken. 1983. Yeah. 1983. It, was, it was considered a yeah. near death blow to Western history to have to discuss the fact that there were women on the trail, too. Yeah. And as I say, there were women on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and there were women here when they got here. But again, it now looks a no-brainer to mm. most people. To most people, yeah. right? I think it's still, uh, there are still people in many of the fields of history that see it still as something to the side. When I, and I think what the paper showed today is how it's absolutely central. Right? Women are central to these stories. I, what, what I liked about today was uh, the sense that w w was the, was the people were treating, the women were treating men the yeah. way that men have traditionally treated women which is to say which is to say that <laughs> you're not you're not anti-men as far as i can tell <laughs> you're just saying that what we're doing is important and the men well they did their thing which is exactly what which is exactly how the men treat w women in the middle ages you know we're i don't think that happened today, <laughs> you, don't think that happened today? No. you think the men got a look in Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, I think, I think I'm just trying to He's say the same thing. He's now crossing his legs and... And his <laughs> body language. So, so, so we have, we are, we are at Penn Libraries, the grateful recipient of seven thousand. No, yeah. Really? <laughs> What's it like processing seven thousand books? <laughs> No, she doesn't. She, she's down in the stacks drinking wine and reading them. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what it's like. Got, no, they came in pretty you're, good you're, shape, didn't you're, they? You're, you're, you're both correct. I started by delegating, and then I realized what was in the collection, and I sent everybody away. <laughs> <laughs> and I've kept it selfishly to myself ever since then. And I have used shimmel as an excuse for just about everything in my life. I'm sorry, I'm busy with <laughs> Caroline's collection right now. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of shimmel work to do. I can't go to that meeting, Will. Yes. Um, and, Will, you must release me from all my other responsibilities. We have a really important exhibition coming up. Yes. <laughs> well, it started early because my fiction collection was the poor stepchild. I, I started it mostly as a joke, <laughs> and, and just it was silly and fun. So I'm a librarian. Everything was on index cards, but I had not bothered to trans starting to transfer that into my database. So I give Penn the collection and two file cap drawers stuff. I started using really thin paper. <laughs> So she gets the two boxes of paper things, so they're about 4,000 in each box, and she proceeds to turn one upside down. <gasps> so for all the meetings that she had in the next month, she was out, had the alphabet in front of her, oh. pretending to listen to the whatever <laughs> meeting she was forced to go to, but also recreating the alphabet. <laughs> well, it was, it was really embarrassing. I mean, you know, here I have these ca two drawers of catalog cards, Enough which have been yeah, they've been assembled over the past half century, <laughs> meticulously written, and and I had only just been able to decipher Caroline's handwriting. So I, you know, it was it was a big step forward. I had these two precious drawers, and. Um, for, for an appraisal that was being done, I had to transcribe a lot of the information into a, a, a database. And the cards contained not only the books that Caroline owned, but it was also the ones that she wanted to get. So it wasn't just, I didn't just have the cards for what was on the shelf, I had cards for things that might someday be on the shelf. But what I really had was a huge mess on the floor that all of a sudden needed to be re-alphabetized. <laughs> and it was pieces of paper glued on pieces of paper, paper clipped together, <laughs> and yeah. It was, it was embarrassing, and I hadn't yet met you. And <laughs> I knew I was going to have to fess up to all of these misshelved <laughs> things on my desk. I was never going to get it done before Caroline arrived, and she that that would be the end of our relationship that had <laughs> only just begun. And yeah, it was terrible. So and it turns out she didn't she didn't care. She just she sent me an email saying, "Well, that was inevitable." <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> so, yeah. so you have a long list of books still to acquire, which presumably grows all the time. Yep. And how does that work? Do you give someone like Kate a list? Does Kate know what, what, what books you want and what to keep an eye out for? Nobody knows mm -hmm. except Mitch. <laughs> 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 uh, very early on, um, the book dealer Johnny Jenkins in Texas offered to print my then, what, it's, it's a bibliography. And Stuart said, no, because you know what's going to happen next. It'll be not in shimmel, is the description, in every book dealer's catalog, because they'll know what, it, what it, I don't have. 
And then, like Bill Reese will add two digits onto the price he's going to ask because he thought I was filthy rich. Yeah, absolutely, right, Mark? Yeah. So it's still just an electric electronic database, which is mine to know and yours to find out. <laughs> or to guess at. Or to, or to guess at. Or to guess at. But there's also the, you with the unknown unknowns yeah. are, yeah. are just everywhere. I mean, yeah. I'm busy writing down names of people, yeah, sending myself, yes, like Nancy has a son who lives in Japan, and I love the murder mystery set in national parks and so forth. And she sweetly offered his services, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, but he was very happy to do it, finding the Japanese editions of certain modern <laughs> writers, series of them. Well, the Japanese, I went to the store in New York, a big Japanese uh, bookstore. They shelved them not by author, but by publisher. Mm. Did you even know this? And I had no idea which publisher Dennis Dabino was you know, being published by, and I couldn't read Japanese. To, and the, the staff there are mostly Japanese, and they don't know really much Amer English, and they couldn't properly explain how to find them. So I gave up, and I put myself on in Nancy's divine son. And he sent me this stacks of what I assume are Japanese. <laughs> 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 I wonder how much the um, the market has changed in this field since you started collecting, and and <coughs> and whether you think that you help make the market if the market has been made. I think that I'm still pretty much it. Mm -hmm. You are. Yeah. You are. Lisa Bastian has um, an she enormous has, collection, but it's a different subject. Yeah, she has an network. Yeah. But and I, early on, I had. Two women, at least. Can you guys speak into the mics? Oh, I, I allegedly had two women. I, there was a period in the early 90s where I'd be bidding at auction and um, would just be totally outbid. And the rumor was floated to me that there were two women in California who had become interested in my field mm -hmm. and just, and they had gazillions of dollars. So there was a slump there. But then, Fortunately, these were Californians. They suddenly saw a new shiny bauble, and they dropped the <laughs> subject, <laughs> and, uh, and I was back. I mean, there, there were dealers who would buy things that they knew I would be interested in solely in order to hold on to them for a week and then offer them back to me. Mm. We're back to Bill Reese now. Mm. May he rest in peace. Mm. And, but yeah, I'm, I, I think I've just captured the flag. There is some crossover, so oh, like yeah. Maria Sibylla Marion, if there are people just for her who will still compete with you on price, right? And there and um, men deign to collect Indian captivities by women, even though they're by women, mm -hmm. and that's and been historic. Some of the true. fiction I noticed that in one of the books you put up Reagan in the pop up was a Willa Cather, that's inscribed to a Dr. White. Is that? It's her grandfather. It is. It is. No. 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 So completely it's coincidental? In oh, in the pop-up. It's completely no, it's coincidental? It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's out because it's... Um, it's it, to Edith, it's, it's Edith Lewis had noted it, saying that Alfred Knopf gave it to her, and then it was uh, given by Edith Lewis, Willa Cather's partner, to draft an official letter to Dr. White about it. So. And it's a Cather or it's a Lewis book? Oh, it's, it's a Cather book, oh, good. but it's inscribed by Lewis. It's actually, oh. it's actually an early 1962 edition of Watson. 1962, yeah. so I just wondered if that had been in your collection before you were collecting. Family. No, it would be in my grandmother Caroline's collection. Hmm. And tiny world story, I <laughs> happened to mention that my grandfather was Willa Cather's last doctor. and. I have now solved a problem because they only knew his initials or something. I knew it was Dr. White. Dr. White. I didn't know that it was William Crawford White. Right. Mm -hmm. He arrived just after she died. Uh, Gretchen yeah. has yeah. been dying to, to ask, ask a, a question. question. Yeah. Mm. Uh, ephemera has all of a kind of, all of a sudden, Nancy, mm. 
<laughs> May I introduce two of my friends, Nancy Rosen, the Valentine lady, and Gretchen Adkins, the alphabet lady. <laughs> Both Girl Year Club members and uh, book and ephemera collectors extraordinaire. Building a building for you? Why did you give our collection to us? Mm. No, why did you give your collection to us? Your your fiction collection to us? Oh, um, well, first I went here. Then um, I've been looking for a place where the, it would be a new game in town. But I wanted an institution also that would have the, uh, the PhD students who could use it as well as the undergraduates. And um, I wanted it to be, well as I say, a new game in town. Like Yale has a huge Western Americana collection. Pe uh, Regan has said that there, with the fiction, is, this was a couple years ago, uh, there was one, less than 1% duplication with their current collection, mm -hmm. which is great fun. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, hello, new stuff to study, mm -hmm. many, many ways to approach it, mm -hmm. many different uh, fields of study. I mean, there's medical botany in there, there's botany, botany, there's uh, exploration, there's human suffering, there's all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, um, and then, I had a couple of friends who had just given a collection to Penn. And they were talking about this new guy <laughs> <laughs> who was just treating them like royals, and I thought, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think I, you made it easy. I, I, you should have seen, he came down to my basement, and as I say, fiction was my stepchild, so it was all in the basement of our little uh, two-story house. And he fell to the floor and started pulling books off and going, oh my God, oh my God, this is so super wonderful. I'm glad I did the right thing. I think you David, is, is, is David, was, David was here. David McKnight was, 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 was there as well. He came as well. Yeah, he was a little embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, often, I often embarrass my curators. I mean, I mean in, in truth, it's a wonderful, wonderful collection for us to have now because... Um, most of our great core collections were collected by men and given by men. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about Henry don't, Charles don't Lee. Name names. Oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay, none yeah. of the, none of them are anonymous anyway. Oh. And, um, <laughs> and 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 you know we're really we're really we're really thinking about diversity and and this is a a wonderful jewel in our crown. So we are we are hugely grateful to you for for choosing us and we and we actually do think we're the right we're the right place for it i think that we can make use of it we have fantastic relations with our faculty and students and um, i think we provide sort of access in a, in a way that very very few uh, research collections do um, i also have another plan plot which is that this is just like a seed idea, and um, I want other people, both women and men, to go, oh, I could give great-grandma's diary mm -hmm. to Penn mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. to, you know, Minnesota or someplace like that. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere on the frontier. Yeah. <laughs> Tiny <laughs> library. <laughs> They've already got Miles a lot Miles from a flushing Minnesota. toilet. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I've already, you know, started uh, planting seeds of ideas about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
the woman who put up this exhibition, Andrea and her wonderful crew, actually is it Minnesota, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. and she admits that she <laughs> yeah, it is and pretty much she admits that she still has her grandmother's handwritten diary mm -hmm. of recipes. And I went, oh, Andrea. <laughs> and not only has a cookbook collection, but they now have a Women in the Wilderness collection. Just think about it. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm going to open it up to the floor. For, yeah. Well, that's a, a two-part answer. Yes, it was an outright donation. Uh, sidebar, my accountant says, Caroline, you have to start earning more money so you can deduct this donation. <laughs> like, what? Also, I am filling in the collection as I help Penn process it, so I'm continuing to donate. But I have a rope, which is the nonfiction still sitting in New York, which could go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I would say it came with sort of moral strings attached. So. No, she's, no, these are she's, real she, strings. These <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, and we have, and we have. Um, you have a cataloging backlog, I'm sure. We 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 do have a cataloging backlog, but we also have Regan Cladstrup. <laughs> uh, the trouble is that we have curators, and so the curators keep on acquiring stuff as fast as Regan and her wonderful crew can can catalog them. But but she's making a huge dent in our backlog. And just a quick plug. Um, we were um, given the stock of the Gotham Bookmark. Oh, wow. Uh, what year, when were we given it? Not long ago. About eight, was eight to ten years eight ago. Eight to ten years ago. And, and, and it was a wonderful, generous gift, but it didn't come with money for processing. We have just finished processing it, and we're going to have an exhibition and conference next spring about it, which, is, which is hugely exciting. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the rest of it came in when Tom Clemens died, and it was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was just a, you know, I mean, that was a problem. Yeah. Well, I am a librarian, so there is at least a card mm -hmm. for every <laughs> single item on my shelf. <laughs> Caroline's, Caroline, Caroline's came in collect. Caroline's, Caroline, Caroline is a fully trained librarian, so in fact, Regan could spend most of her time drinking wine and reading the book. <laughs> oh, she would have done, except for the except except person. for the except for the fact that the first collection that uh, that, that that when I started working for Regan, the first collection that came in was the um, was not Caroline's collection, but the Vermont Marvel Company, and that arrived in the back of a. Back of a horse box, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. And four horse. A four truck. horse. Four horse truck. truck. That isn't actually processed yet, is it? No. <laughs> not, not, not quite. No, no, no. Not quite. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but no, and in that collection, there were, uh, you know, we were unloading all of these boxes from the horse truck, 
And um, I finally found something that I thought was really, really worth it. It was pink, it was sparkly, it was beautiful. I thought they sent us gems or it must be some pink marble. And I pulled it out of the truck and the woman driving it said, no, give that back, that's a salt lick. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, I was very keen on, I was very keen on getting this collection because, uh, because, because the Vermont Marble Company was the was the company that provided the marble for the Beinecke Library, and I thought I, oh. it'd be great to have that archive, but it was the worst I, decision I think, I've made. I think since it's, it's unprocessed, why not put it on deposit at the Beinecke? <laughs> oh, what a good idea! <laughs> We'd never get it into their dirty room, let alone out. Uh, but, but, but yes, okay. Of the catalog Chimmels, yes. 5,050. 5, yes. Yeah. Hi, Mitch. Um, 5,000 in, like, what, years? What? Yes. Yes, it is. And um, yet Liz, is, Liz has been ch chugging through them and, 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 and really enjoying it. It's her treat for is doing some of the other things. Is she reading them, too? Yes, but she's a faster reader than I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm... I'm you know, it's it's our, our, the, the the outside world gets to see our curators. Um, the core of the other core of our operation is the, is, is the processing and the catalogers and and Regan's involvement in this collection is a chance for us to, to, to celebrate their work because it's it's completely amazing and. Uh, and they're it's also, they, they do blogs every once in a while. I believe, isn't Mitch, is this week's blog? A Schimmel blog? Uh, it better be. It's supposed <laughs> to be. <laughs> it is. Quick, change the day. Okay, yeah. No, the, is, this week's blog is supposed to be, a, a, is about a Schimmel. Which one? What's the, what's the website? Mrs. Vetter, yes. There, thank you. Who, Thanks, Amy. Anyone know who Mrs. Vetter is? <laughs> Caroline doesn't know who Mrs. Vetter is. She wrote a book in your collection. <laughs> <laughs> Naturalization authors. You have to read the blog. Okay. So, where would the blog be? This is through the special collection. Penrare.com. All right, there we go. There was a blog the other day, a wonderful blog by Liz about a book plate. Is this. But anyway, okay. But And that was a book plate in the Schimmel collection. In the Schimmel collection, but I think it may be a different. Blog. Right. It was a weird book plate. Right. Mm. <laughs> You'll find more. <laughs> I never, I never drink before six o'clock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's time for one more question, Laura. <laughs> Hurry up.
know, have an update and go over it, which is the church query and the internal staff correspondence. And um, <clears throat> the University of Illinois will have an update, and as Carolyn was referring to earlier about the Maryland Rape and Rape Aid Campaign, mm -hmm. which is one of our side projects for 20 years and has now been uh, it no longer a privilege to rape one's wife. Mm -hmm. In the United States, right? I'm sorry? In the United States. Yes, but we also did 20 other countries oh, and other did technologies. You? Oh, nice. And okay. we won in Beijing unanimously. I think it's time to raise a glass mm. to Laura and her mm. success and to us. And to us. Okay. It's time to glass raise it. So I do, I want to thank Caroline. I want to thank Regan. I want to thank John, I want to thank Lynn, I want to thank all the speakers. It's been a wonderful couple of days and uh, just terrific. Thank you all so much.